A cell membrane is like what latex is to a balloon. Without it, you wouldn't have a balloon, just air. A cell without a membrane is just soup. So what is a cell membrane? Well, it's a lipid bilayer embedded with proteins. Just like there were reporters embedded with the troops surging to Iraq, there are proteins embedded to a field of phospholipids. Cell membranes are selectively permeable. They let some things in with no problems, they let other things in with permission, and other things can never get in. This is kind of like a prison gate in that respect. Air can come and go, prison guards and visitors can come and go under specific conditions, but those prisoners are stuck. Therefore, a prison is selectively permeable. Remember phospholipids have hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. So when they're in water, the hydrophilic heads turn toward the water and the hydro hydrophobic tails turn away from it. This causes a bilayer, two layers, with water on both sides. This is the basic structure of the cell membrane. Cellular permeability is how easy it is to get across the cell membrane. There are two basic types. First, there is passive diffusion. This happens when a chemical requires no energy to move across the membrane. And this happens because those molecules are moving from a high concentration to a low concentration. Imagine thousands of eager Justin Bieber fans waiting outside an arena. The door opens and they rush in, trampling each other in their teenage crazed hysteria, filling an empty stadium. Well, that's like passive diffusion. The fans went from a high concentration to a low concentration. Wait, I can't concentrate. Why do people like that Justin Bieber kid? I guess I'm old after all. Well, if that makes me old, bring it on, Father Time. I'm not looking back. Active diffusion is just the opposite. It requires energy to cross the cell membrane. Specifically, it requires ATP. Now let's go back to our Justin Bieber concert. Uh, do we really have to? Yes, this is for science by George. Imagine getting to the concert late. I can imagine you're cursing your mother and saying something like, You ruined my life! Or, You just don't understand, Mom! Well, the arena is packed, but you're determined to make your way to the front row. But it takes work to get there. That is active diffusion. Alright, let's watch a super awesome video on membrane transport. We get all our energy and organic molecules from food. Before we can use the molecules we eat, they have to enter our cells, starting with the cells lining the small intestine. Let's zoom in to the surface of a cell. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Some molecules can move across it, while others cannot. How do materials enter and leave cells? Lipids, such as these yellow molecules, can dissolve in the lipid bilayer. Notice how they move down their concentration gradient, from where they are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated. This is an example of diffusion. Diffusion is a form of passive transport. It does not require energy from the cell. Most molecules can't cross the lipid bilayer. Here, the sugar fructose moves into intestinal cells by facilitated diffusion, moving down its concentration gradient through a transport protein. Facilitated diffusion doesn't require energy from the cell, so it's also a form of passive transport. Water crosses the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion, or by diffusing across the lipid bilayer directly. The diffusion of water across a membrane is called osmosis. The sodium-potassium pump moves ions against their concentration gradient, from where they are less concentrated to where they are more concentrated. This requires energy from the cell and is known as active transport. Energy from ATP is used to move sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions in. Another type of active transport is co-transport. Here, both sodium ions and glucose move into the cell through a co-transporter protein. Sodium ions move down the concentration gradient created by the sodium-potassium pump, and glucose moves against its concentration gradient.
Now let's move to the other side of our intestinal cell. Materials can be exported in vesicles that fuse with the plasma membrane and release their contents outside the cell. This process is called exocytosis. In endocytosis, the plasma membrane pinches in, forming a vesicle that contains material from outside the cell. On this side of the cell, we can also see oxygen and carbon dioxide diffusing across the lipid bilayer. Cells use all these processes to get what we need. Well, simple diffusion is our first Justin Bieber concert example. However, let's bring this back to cells. Let's stop talking about Justin Bieber, please. Here we have an example of high concentration of molecules in the outer part of a cell membrane. Inside is the low concentration. The molecules in this example move from the membrane freely until the concentrations on both sides equalize. This is known as simple diffusion. Water does this in cells, and we have a special term for the simple diffusion of water, and that term is osmosis. Here we have three different types of osmotic conditions. A regular healthy cell is said to be isotonic. It is in a Goldilocks state, just right. If you eat too much salt, you create a condition in which there are more salt molecules in the space between your cells than in your cells, and water will leave the cells, creating a hypertonic condition. On the flip side, it is actually possible to die from drinking too much water. That's right. It is possible to die from drinking too much water. Marathon runners have to be acutely aware of their water intake because there is a tendency to drink water to cool down when they're running. There have been incidences where marathon runners have consumed too much water to a point where their cells become so hypotonic that they burst. But you shouldn't worry about that. It's pretty hard to do. Facilitated diffusion is another type of passive transport. Certain chemicals are too big to fit through the pores of the cell membrane. However, they can be allowed to move from high concentration to low concentration through proteins. Here we have two different examples of how bigger materials move through the cell membrane with the help of proteins. On the left, we have a protein channel. Anything that can fit in the channel can move freely into and out of the cell. On the right, we have carrier proteins. They use a different approach. They are more choosy. The proteins have a specific shape that is the complement of certain molecules, just like a lock and key. Once that key fits in the lock, the protein changes shape and releases the molecule into the other side of the membrane. Think of it like a revolving door. Now it's important to note that that doesn't require any energy. It just happens based on shape. Active transport requires energy to move substances from one side of the membrane to the other. First, I'll tell you about primary active transport. It is primary because it uses ATP directly to transport molecules from one side of the membrane to the other. The classic example of this is the sodium-potassium pump. There are these cup-shaped proteins that bind specifically with sodium ions. ATB comes by and releases energy, which causes the shape of the cup to invert, forcing the sodium ions to spit out on the other side of the membrane. This is important because sodium is not very useful to a cell, and it needs to get rid of it. On the flip side, Potassium is needed by the cell, and it has to be pumped in. But the interesting thing is that it is pumped in by the same proteins. However, to get in doesn't require any more energy. The protein is like a two-way seesaw working in sync. Right after the sodium gets spit out, the potassium binds to the protein and gets forced into the cell. This produces a cell with the insides of a high potassium concentration and a low sodium concentration. Have you heard of the book, Everyone Poops? Well, it's true. Every living thing's poop. We do it. Horses do it. But even plants and fungies do it. Now, this is just plain crazy. Cells do it. Poop! We have a nicer name for it, though. Exocytosis. Exo means to exit, and cytosis means cellular. Cellular exit. Within the cell, certain molecules that have no use to the cell are imprisoned by a liposome. Note the phospholipid bilayer. In this side, they call it a secretory vesicle. That secretory vesicle moves toward the cell membrane. The fossil, phospholipids of the secretory vesicle fuse with the cell membrane, eventually releasing it, the molecules, into the extracellular space. Cells poop. 
Endocytosis is the bringing of stuff into a cell. Endo means in and cytosis means cellular into the cell. A type of endocytosis is pinocytosis. Pino is Greek for bringing together and cytosis means cellular. So bringing together into the cell. And that's what it is. Cell membranes can form these vessels and these vessels can fill with stuff. Then the cell membrane pinches off and the phospholipid bilayer of the membrane attaches to itself, producing a package of solutes that can float around the cell. Cells eat too. Another type of endocytosis is receptor-mediated endocytosis. We said that the cell membrane is embedded with proteins. Well, some of these proteins form receptors. These receptors are like outfielders are to baseballs. They snatch them up. When those receptors fill, they cause a chemical reaction which causes the cell membrane to pinch in and eventually form a vesicle which floats around inside the cell. The advantage of this over pinocytosis is that specific chemicals are selected, handpicked if you will, to go into the cell, where in case of the pinocytosis, any solute that is there will make, it, make its way into the cell. It is thought that the first cell developed 4.0 to 4.3 billion years ago. That's nearly right after the Earth came to be. There are several theories about how it came to be. The first cells could have blasted on to Earth by meteorites or spontaneously generated from deep sea vents or by lightning. Well, it is assumed that RNA was the first self-replicating molecule. This is assumed because RNA is the simplest self-replicating molecule that we know of. It is also assumed that the first cells were heterotrophs. In other words, they couldn't make their own energy. They were reliant on other energy sources. Plants, by contrast, make their own energy and considered autotrophs. Humans are heterotrophs. We can't produce our own food. We are reliant upon plants. The cell theory of biology states that cells are the basic units of life, and there cannot be cells without cell membranes. So the first cells probably included two elements of a cell membrane enclosing RNA. Those two components are fundamental. In water, phospholipids spontaneously form bilayered vesicles. This could have preceded the genesis of RNA or not, we don't really know. They very may well have arisen independently and merged into a beautiful marriage which evolved into what we know, now know as life.